that again. Sing all oh, praise. Every voice, sing it out. How the Lord our God will praise His name forevermore for endless days. We will sing Your praise. Sing, O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord our God. Come on, can you give Him one more time, praise? Oh
said, just fix your eyes on him. If the world tries to distract you, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on him, the deliverer, the healer, the promise giver, the promise maker, the promise keeper, Jesus. Sing I surrender all. Come on, sing it up. Sing I surrender all. We lay it all before you and all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. One last time. before you who we are Jesus oh Lord we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness I pray that you will bless this congregation as they pursued you as they've opened their hearts to worship you in, in spirit and in truth we bless your name this morning we thank you for your presence come on let's give Jesus praise one more time he is worthy he's here he's in this room right now hallelujah he's working in our midst and he has something so special for you even more throughout the message. So are you ready to receive even more from him this morning? As we've, we've worshiped him, now he's going to pour out even more. Amen. All right, if you could do me a favor, turn around, say hello to the person next to you, and then you may be seated. God bless you guys. Welcome, welcome, we're so glad that you're here. We would encourage you um, before you leave today to visit the Meet the Pastors table. Pastors to uh, Pastor Todd will be out there today and he'd love to present you with a gift and uh, know your name and get to say hi to you. We would also ask if you're visiting for the first time, would you mind filling out one of these connection cards uh, found in the seat pocket in front of you? This is just a way for us to get to know you better, to pray for you and to get you plugged in if that is what you're ready to do here at Radiant. Now, if you've been attending for a little while now and you are interested in hearing more about the heart of Radiant Church in the hearts of our lead pastors, Todd and Kelly Hudnell, we would invite you to take the Ascent classes it's a series of four online classes you can take at your own pace in the comfort of your own home. Um, it'll just tell you more about Radiant and what we burn for here at Radiant. Um, we would encourage you to email us for that link. It's at uh, email me at connect at radiantchurch.org. I'll send you the link to the classes and then let me know when you're finished and I'll set up a meeting with you to answer any questions that you have and to get you going in your next steps here at Radiant. Um, before you leave today, here at Radiant, we stand for biblical values. Anybody else? Can I get an amen on that? We stand for biblical values. So we have a very important uh, table out in the foyer right now. 
It's Protect Our Kids Colorado. There are two very important ballot initiatives that we are asking you to go out there and if you're a, a, a registered voter in Colorado, be sure and sign those petitions to stand up for our kids and to protect them from the just the evil agendas that are out um, to destroy a generation. Amen. Be sure, make your voice heard. Sign those petitions. It'll just take you a couple of minutes before you go today. This will be the last weekend we have that petition here at our Radiant campuses. So don't miss that opportunity. And for more information on what you're signing, be sure and visit protectourkidscolorado.org. Also, um, there has never been a more important time for us to gather together as a body to pray. Amen. Anybody else feeling that urgency right now? Well, this Tuesday, we have our Roar service right here at the Central Campus from 5 to 6.30. So any time that you can come by in that time to pray together, to unite in one accord, to uh, just pray the heart of the Father, we want to get together to do that. So this Tuesday, hopefully we will see you between 5 and 6.30 here at Central Campus campus. Well, at this time, you know that every month we like to highlight a missions window. So today we um, have a very unique and special missions window. So at this time, I'd like to invite forward Pastor Tommy and Pastor Jenny to share with you the missions window for this month. Good morning, Radiant Church. How are you doing today? I wanna start out first by saying thank you to Pastor Todd and Pastor Kelly Hudnell for this opportunity. As many of you have already heard, uh, our family is really being called into a new season in our lives. And today we have the blessing, we have the honor and privilege to share about that. In 2019, we actually received a call and a, and a desire from the Lord to plant a church in Peyton and Falcon, Colorado. And uh, we went through all of the process. We got permission. We started the preparation. And then, of course, as it always happens, God opened not just one door, but two doors. And that second door was I received a call from Pastor Todd stating that he wanted to bring me on as the central campus pastor. So, of course, what did I do in that time? I was celebrating, one, a calling, but two, we were going, what is the right choice that we need to make? And whenever you question that, the best place to go is in prayer. So we prayed about that and we truly and strongly felt that we needed to pause the church plant and accept the opportunity to come here to Radiant Church. And I have had the privilege and honor for the last uh, over four years of being your central campus pastor. But about five weeks ago, we were in, I was in Utah for our Rocky Mountain Ministry Network Council, which is part of the Assemblies of God. And there they unveiled the plans to start a new initiative called Go Rural. Now, this is a strategic initiative where they are targeting 52 zip codes that they want to have church plants go to between Colorado and Utah so that we can bring the spirit of the Lord in each and every one of these rural areas. Now, Jenny and I are natives of Colorado, and for any of you that have been here more than 20 years, you know that Falcon and Peyton used to be considered the country. Uh, not too many people said, yay, we're going to Falcon and Peyton, but now it's a booming area. In fact, over the last decade, it's gone from a population of 10,000 people to over 40,000 people. How many spirit-filled churches are in that area, though? The answer is zero but we're about to change that. What we're looking to do is we're going out there, thank you. We're looking to go out there and make that change. In 2019, we were called, and now in 2024, we're going to be sent. And thank you to Radiant Church and the Rocky Mountain Ministry Network for giving us this opportunity. We are gonna be called, our church name is uh, Riverstone Chapel. And even though we are not considered a uh, affiliate of Radiant Church, we're called an independent church plant. We're actually receiving a blessing as well as an equipping for us to go start this. And so we are forever grateful to, uh, to Radiant Church for doing that. At Riverstone Chapel, our purpose is to really fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ, which we believe is the original mission statement given to the church. We're gonna be a spirit-filled dynamic church whose main focus is knowing and living the word of God, making disciples and helping people grow a healthy relationship with Jesus so they can lead a holy and healthy life. 
We thrive on enriching and helping people build that relationship with Jesus through discipleship, community, and helping them discover their purpose for what God has in plan in their lives. But we need you. And here's what we're asking you for this, uh, this today, is we're actually asking for your prayers. If you know our family, we are huge on prayer and trust me, it took many years for us to get this move going. And it was a hard decision for us. But when Jesus calls us to get out of the boat, we need to get out of the boat and focus on him. So here's what we're asking for you, is if you guys would partner with us in prayer, the three prayer points that we're looking for is one, pray that the Lord will continue to open doors for us. And trust me, he's already blessed so many doors to be open. I'd love to share every one of them, but just continue to pray that those doors continue to be opened. Two, pray that we will get the people that we need to successfully launch this church. And the third point is pray that the Lord will bless us with finances to not just grow the church, but really spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in Falcon and Peyton, but in the state of Colorado. Lastly, if you happen to know anybody in that area who does not have a church, or maybe they're looking for a home church, let them know that Riverstone Chapel's coming and we're bringing in the fire of the Holy Spirit with us, amen? Um, Radiant Church, thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your lives for these years. Thank you for allowing us to minister to you, pray with you, and disciple you. Just know we love you. You're always going to have a special place in our hearts, and we're always here for you. We love you. Thank you, Tommy. Well, we appreciate it. Tommy and Jenny and their family, they have served Radiant well as Central Campus pastors. And, um, you know, not uh, too long ago, we received a prophetic word from Cindy Jacobs who said we would be sending out more church planters and sending out more missionaries. And I think this is the beginning of seeing that happen. And so we're going to pray over them today. At the end of the service, there is going to be a reception out in the foyer. Uh, so we would love to have you be a part of that today if you'd like to. But let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Dunn family. We thank you for your calling upon their life. We thank you that they've said yes to Jesus. They've said yes to doing what you've called them to do. And Father, we pray that your grace would go with them, that they would have the grace to fulfill this calling. And we pray for favor upon their life, favor as a shield, favor and good understanding in the sight of both God and man, favor with who you want them to have favor with. We ask, Father, for blessing, that you would bless the work of their hands as they step out and obey you. And we ask, Lord, for a fresh anointing to come upon their life to carry out this ministry. Lord, we ask that this ministry would flourish in the Falcon Peyton area. We pray for thousands of people being touched and being changed by the power of God through their ministry. And Lord, we give you honor and glory for all you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Love you guys. We're going to get ready to receive this morning's offering, so I'm going to ask the ushers to come at this time. I've got a little competition today. I'm not sure what's going on with the feedback. I keep messing with my microphone, hoping it's going to get better. So I think it will by the message. But we are uh, have an opportunity, if you'd like to give, uh, toward uh, Riverstone Church, you can, your Riverstone Chapel, you can actually designate it on your offering envelope, or you can text 84321 and just use the keyword Riverstone. And today, we also uh, want to pray as we get ready to receive this offering for our middle school camp that's coming up. We have young people going to the camp this week. It's going to be a powerful time for them. So we want to lift them up. Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Tommy and Jenny and the call of God on their life and how you're going to use them. And we send them out now in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we do pray on this Memorial Day for those who have given their lives in service to our country. Father, I pray that today we would remember once again that freedom isn't free and that there is a price to be paid for the kind of freedoms we've enjoyed here in America. 
I pray, Father, that we would recognize that and understand our part and our responsibility. And we pray for any that are grieving today over the loss of a loved one. And Father, I want to pray a special prayer for those in need of healing or for those who have fan friends or family right now that uh, are dealing with sickness and disease. I I just sense we're to pray over that today. Lord, I I pray over the lady who talked to me at the beginning of this service, who has uh, a sister going in for surgery for brain cancer. Lord, we we thank you that you're a healing Jesus, that you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer, that you are a God who brings healing and restoration and recovery. So we just join our faith together to pray for people who need healing right now. We ask you to stretch forth your hand to heal, to do signs, wonders, and miracles. And I pray for peace in all of our hearts and minds today, knowing that you're a God who's in control. Father, we thank you for our middle schoolers as they go to camp this week. We pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit that these young people's lives would never be the same. And we thank you now that as your word is proclaimed today, the lives would be changed by it. Open our hearts, open our minds to receive the word of God. And may we forever be changed. And now, Father, we give, not out of necessity, but because you love a cheerful giver. And we are so grateful to give back to you what you've given to us. And we thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. When he was in that cold, dark tomb, it came into the tomb, it came into his body, into every cell, every organ, every tissue, every fiber of his being, and brought the King of glory back to life. The resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, lives and dwells in us, and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. All of the powers of darkness that have taken over the seven mountains, that have taken over government, and are enforcing evil agendas are doing it illegally because we have laid down our power and our authority because we have not had eyes enlightened to see and understand who we are and the greatness of his calling upon our life it's time to rise up in authority speak to the mountains Speak to the gates over our state. Command them to close to wickedness and perversion and open to righteousness, holiness and truth. When I was a young boy, my favorite day of the week was Saturday. And my favorite time of the day was Saturday morning. Because on our three, you got that, three television channels, they showed programming for children. It was wonderful. I mean, it's mainly cartoons. And one they showed every single week was Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, Popeye had a challenge. His name was Bluto. Bluto was always after him. Bluto was always fighting him. Bluto was always putting him down, bullying him, brutalizing him. It was terrible. Until finally Popeye said, I can't stand it no more. (laughs) And when he did, he would reach for spinach. That can of spinach was also a can of whooping. And he would pull it out and he would gulp it down and suddenly his forearms became as big as mine. And he went after Bluto and he went from a victim to a victor. Well, today in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to look how we can move from being a victim to a victor by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead and open to Ephesians chapter 3. We've been in the study of the book of Ephesians. It's been very enlightening as we've been going through. Last time we were together, we saw how God has taken both Jew and Gentile. You could say he's taken every nationality, every ethnicity, he's taken every social standing, and he's made them all one in Christ Jesus, and he's brought about a new humanity. And that new humanity in Christ now has become part of God's kingdom. The church is God's kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ. It's God's kingdom at work in the earth. It's also become God's home, God's household, God's family. And finally, it's become God's new holy temple, a dwelling place for God in the spirit. And so after
after studying all of that, we come to Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 1. And Paul says this, For this reason, all those things I just mentioned, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, here's what's really interesting. Paul is starting this verse, but he doesn't continue where he had planned to go. Some of you have been like that before, where you start to say something and your mind goes over here and so you head over here instead of saying or doing what you were going to do. That's what Paul did. Paul is getting ready to pray a prayer, but in the middle of getting ready to pray this prayer, he has another thought. And I'm so glad he did. It's a parenthetical thought. And then we see a resumptive all the way down at the end in verse 14 where he says, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in between, he has this additional thought. He has this parenthetical idea and he's going to share it with us. And I'm so glad he did. See, some of you think it's ADD, but I think it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit prompted him to go down this path because it has powerful truth for us today. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, and listen to this, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. This is my first observation. We are all called to be prisoners of of Christ. In some sense, we're all prisoners. You could say we're all servants. We're all slaves to something. When I was in college, this is hard to believe now, but I was a rock and roll disc jockey. Um, it was before I came to Christ, and, and frankly, um, I thought it was pretty cool at the time. So I would get on the radio, and, and this was back when you would take a 45 and you would, or an album. Does anybody know what those are? Um, okay. And you would, you would take them and you would get them just right to start. And then you'd say some cool little thing and then the music would start and the singing would go. It, it, was, it was ridiculous. But anyway, there was a song at the time that was extremely popular. It was by a man named Bob Dylan. And it was called, You Gotta Serve Somebody. And it went, you got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And it's true. All of us serve something. It may be materialism. It may be another person. It may be an accomplishment. I don't know what it is, but we all serve something. And if you are not serving Jesus Christ, those things so often will put you in bondage. You're also a prisoner. You're a prisoner of something, or you're a prisoner of someone. And so often, you become a prisoner to circumstances, situations, and people. And through it, you become a victim. When you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ, though, you no longer are a slave to the world, the flesh, and the devil. You are no longer a victim to circumstances or temporary earthly conditions. You're no longer a slave or a prisoner to pride, entitlement, and self-centeredness, which leads to offense and bitterness. You're no longer limited by your own thinking and small thinking, but you now are able to step into everything God has for you. Now, if you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ, it can set you free, but it doesn't exempt you from suffering because everybody suffers. Everybody in this room at some level, at some time, has suffered in their life. And there are at least three kinds of suffering. And I'd call the first one self-imposed suffering. Where because of something you did, you're now suffering. Maybe it was something stupid. Maybe it was something irrational. Maybe it was just a wrong decision. But because of a decision you made, you're suffering. And people have many regrets over that kind of suffering. And then you could call it innocent suffering. In a way, I don't like that term because none of us are innocent. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there are times people suffer just because we live in a fallen world. In fact, one of the big objections to Christianity is if God is good, why is there so much suffering? And people usually say that because they've suffered in their life and they don't understand it. But understand that we live in a fallen world. And bad things happen to all kinds of people. And it's part of life when people suffer. 
and God weeps over it. He's easily moved by the feeling of our infirmity. But because God gave us free choice, man chose against God. And because of that, there was a historic fall and there is human suffering. The final kind of suffering I'd like to mention is suffering for Christ's sake. You see, as a follower of Jesus Christ, not only are you not exempt from suffering, but sometimes you suffer because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, let me say, if you've never suffered persecution for your faith, I question how passionately you're following Jesus Christ. Because if you're really following Jesus at some level, you're going to face persecution. And you're going to face suffering. Paul was suffering because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. Because of his commitment to Christ, he was a prisoner. And he was a prisoner at this time under house arrest. Now, he'd been a prisoner for nearly five years by this time. He'd had various forms of incarceration. But at this point, he is probably chained to a Roman guard. But it's in a rented house. And he is able to receive guests. And he's able to have even someone who is a secretary who is able to write down what he's dictating to them. And Paul is a prisoner who has embraced his prison cell for Jesus Christ. And wherever we find ourselves, we need to see it as being there for Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, you can take that situation. And some of you are in difficult circumstances. Some of you feel like you're in a prison. You feel trapped by your circumstances and trapped by your situation. And you have a choice to make when you're suffering. How are you going to handle it? What is going to be your perspective? What is going to be your outlook? Let me give you an illustration of what it's like. Let's say that you're standing down at the bottom of a hill. And at the top of the hill, there is a massive boulder. And there are different ways people handle it when that boulder starts rolling down the hill straight at them. One way people handle a bolder situation like that is to turn into a fatalist. There are Christian fatalists. Christian fatalists are people who really do not understand a right understanding of the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He is in control. But that doesn't mean that everything that happens is simply the will of God. Christian fatalists are more like Islamics. A Muslim believes the will of Allah be done. No matter what happens, it's just the will of Allah. That is not Christianity. And so when the boulder is coming, the Christian fatalist says, this must be the will of God. Oh my, here it comes. Crunch. I'm so glad that's over. That is the Christian fatalist. Then you have the complainer. The complainer is the one who sees the boulder coming down and says, this always happens to me. Why me? How did this have to happen? Why am I the one these kind of things always happen to? And then they get clobbered and they say, God, why? 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 Why me? And then, of course, you have the Stoic. Stoicism is not Christianity. The Stoic says, I'm just going to be tough. I'm just going to gut it out. I'm just going to put up with it. Here comes the boulder. It's coming. It's rolling down on me. And and it's, oh, it's not going to hurt. Oh, it hurts so bad. I'm not going to toughen it up. I'm not going to feel that. I'm not going to complain about the pain. It's just, I'm just going to be tough. That's the Stoic. Then you have the hyperfaith Christian who sees the boulder running down and they say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are not going to touch me. No weapon for it. Oh, and they get ran over. And then they say, I must not have enough faith. And then there's the biblical Christian. The biblical Christian sees a boulder coming down. He may rebuke it. He may pray over it. He may ask that the Lord would take it away from coming down on him, but it does come down on him. But when it comes down on him, he embraces the boulder. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do with the boulder? See, that's what Paul did. He's in a prison cell and he grabs a hold of his chains and he says, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people on the outside may say, now, Paul, 
That's nonsense. You're a prisoner of Rome. You're a prisoner of Nero. And he says, no, no, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ didn't want me here, I wouldn't be here. And he must have a plan and a purpose for his glory here in this prison cell. And so often that is how the Bible handles suffering and difficulty. Over in Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 to 40, we see someone suffering injustice, someone suffering in a way that would feel like a prison. And Jesus says this, I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. What is this talking about? This is talking about suffering. It's talking about injustice. And what do you do when it comes into your life? The idea is you choose. You choose, instead of being a victim, to be a victor. When they slap you for the cause of the gospel on your right cheek, you look like a victim. But when you turn your left cheek to them, you're now a victor. You've chosen. Or in that day, actually, the Roman military could have a soldier out and he sees a Jew walking along and he says, I demand you to carry my pack. Well, under Roman law, he had to carry that pack for a mile. Well, while he's carrying it, he looks like a victim. But at the end of that mile, if he takes the pack off and throws it down, he is a victim. And typically they would do that. They'd throw it down, they'd spit, they'd curse at the Roman soldier, and they'd run off. But not this man. He takes his pack a mile and says, now I choose to take it for you another mile. He is no longer a victim. He's chosen. He is a victor. And that's what Paul did in the prison cell. He chose, I'm going to use this situation for the glory of God. It is choosing to be in a suffering situation and embracing it as part of God's redemptive plan. Now understand, it's not condoning evil, but it's allowing God to work out his redemptive plan amid evil, amid suffering. You choose not to be a victim, but you're going to be a victor. Now, where has God placed you? Do you feel like you're in a prison cell today? Well, embrace it for the glory of God. If you're living for the glory of God, then your suffering is transformed into something beautiful. Let me put it this way. Jesus suffered on the cross, not so that we'd be free from any suffering. He suffered on the cross so that when we suffer, we become more like Jesus. That's God's purpose and that's God's plan. You see, circumstances happen that feel like they trap us. And when they do, it feels like we're missing out on something. It's not so much the prison. It's what we're missing out by being in the prison. Paul could have been like that. Because you know what Paul loved? You know what he believed his mission and his purpose in life was? To travel around the known world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his mission. That was his calling. He would go and he would plant a church. He would set elders in that church. And then he'd go on to the next church. And then he'd plant a church. And then he'd go on to the next, church, uh, next place and plant a church. But here, he's trapped in a prison. He can't go do it. So what is Paul going to do? Well, he embraces his prison cell. And instead he sits down and begins to write letters. He writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. We would not have those books of the Bible if Paul had not been incarcerated. If he had not embraced his prison and said, I'm going to use it for the glory of God. Instead of saying, why me, God? Paul said, what now, God? See, some of you are in a season of life and you just want that season to pass. And I don't blame you. I get it. But many times what God wants you to do in that season is not say, I hate this. I want it to pass. But God, I'm going to embrace this for your glory in this season, in this time, in this moment. You're going to be glorified in my life and I am going to fulfill your purpose. Now notice what he goes on to say. Not only does he say he's a prisoner, but he says, for you Gentiles. The reason Paul was in prison was because of the Ephesians. Because of you and me. Because of Gentiles. Why? Well, because Paul preached a very unpopular message. 
If he had simply said, yes, the Messiah has come. And you can become a Christian, but first you have to become a Jew. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep all the dietary restrictions and all of the rules of Judaism. He wouldn't have suffered much persecution. The problem was he had this incredible message that God now has a brand new humanity where he takes both Jew and Gentile and makes them one in the church of Jesus Christ. And that message got him into a tremendous amount of trouble. The Ephesians didn't like the message. That is the Jews in Ephesus. And so some of them are in the temple one day and Paul's in the temple. And he is with a man named Trophimus and they are in the temple in the Gentile part of the temple, which was fine. But then later they see Paul in the Jewish part of the temple and they assume that he must have brought Trophimus in there. So they get angry. They cause a riot. They beat Paul up. He's taken and then he's incarcerated. And that's why he is in this house arrest that he's writing the letter from. He's sitting in Rome shackled to a guard because of his commitment to seeing the Gentiles come to Christ. And folks, I want you to understand something. We are prisoners and God wants us to be a prisoner like Paul was for the lost Gentiles. He wants us to be the prisoner for lost people all around us. Strangers and pilgrims, those who do not know Jesus Christ. When I talk about this, I can't help but think about the Moravians. There was a man named Count von Zinzendorf, and there were persecuted Christians all over Europe. So he calls them to Hernhut, which was an estate he owned, and there they form a community, and there they begin a prayer meeting that lasted 100 years, 24 hours a day. Can you imagine that? A hundred year prayer meeting that lasted 24 hours a day for a hundred years. And they were primarily praying for world evangelization. That the calling of Jesus to reach the world with the gospel would be fulfilled. That they would make disciples of all nations. And out of that came an amazing missions movement. In fact, one out of ten people in Hernhut became missionaries. Isn't that amazing? And their motto was, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Well, some of those Moravian missionaries that were the very first ones to go out went to St. Thomas in the Caribbean. And they felt they were to minister to those who were slaves at, on St. Thomas. <laughs> but there was no way to access them. There was no way to get to them. So you know what they did? They sold themselves into slavery so they could reach the slaves. They were prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ for the lost. And I have to ask you and I have to ask me, what are we doing to reach the lost? How are we involved in the Great Commission? How are we prisoners for the sake of the lost? See, some of us, if we really want to reach the lost, is going to put us in situations we'd rather not be in. Getting maybe out of our comfort zone. Maybe reaching out to people that are different than us, people we really don't want to talk to, people we really don't want to befriend, people we don't really want to invest in, but God has called us to be prisoners for the lost. I think God may be speaking to many of us about that today. He goes on to say in verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now that word dispensation is a little bit confusing because dispensation is a very loaded word. I think there could have been a better translation. In fact, I looked at other translations of the Bible and they came up with the words administration, stewardship, commission, responsibility. Paul is simply saying, God has given me gifts. He's given me a ministry office. And from that, God has given me a gift of a revelation that's for you Gentiles. Verses 3 and 4. How that by revelation he made known to me, listen to this, the mystery. In previous weeks we talked about the mystery. Let's talk about it again. The mystery as I have briefly written already by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The word mystery is the Greek word musterion. It's used 27 times in the New Testament. And I could get into a whole big discussion. I could do a message on the subject of the mystery. But the mystery either has to do with the gospel 
or ramifications of the gospel. And what the mystery was, it's not like a murder mystery where you're trying to figure it out and your intellect can come up with it. It came by direct revelation from God. It was total counterintuitive. You would have never thought of this on your own. It was something that was concealed in the Old Testament, but now is revealed in the New Testament. It's a mystery only that God had not yet revealed it. It was prophesied of in the Old Testament. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. Nobody knew it until the New Testament time when God brought the revelation into understanding. Look at verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now, that is in the New Testament, been revealed by the Spirit. So Paul didn't just figure this out. He didn't come up with it. It was a revelation by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Colossians 1.26 explains the mystery this way. The mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. So it's that which previously was hidden, but now is disclosed. Verse 6 goes on, and here it is. This is part of the mystery. That the Gentiles, that is those who are not Jews, should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ. So, so what is this part of the mystery? This part of the mystery, the mystery all has to do with the church or the ramifications of the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying this part of the mystery is that now God has one new humanity. That he's taking Jews and Gentiles and making them one. That Jews do not have one access to God and Gentiles another. But everyone has access through Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by him. And through Christ we all become one body, the church of Jesus Christ. Now that wasn't understood in the Old Testament. Yet there were shadows of it. In Genesis chapter 3, when man falls, God says there's a Satan crusher coming. And through him, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He's come to redeem the entire human race. So you knew it was coming. He didn't just come to redeem the Jewish people. He's coming through the Jewish people, but he's going to redeem the entire human race. Then you get over to Genesis 12, and Abraham is the one he's going to use. It's, it's his line. And God says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And through you, that is through the Jewish people, through the Hebrew people, through Abraham, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So they understood that somehow the nations of the world are going to be blessed through the Jewish people. But they thought it was directly through them. Even though Isaiah prophesied that this message of redemption was going to go all over the world, even to the islands of the world. But what they didn't understand is it wasn't going to come through the Jews so that all the world became Jews. It was going to come through the Jews in that Jesus Christ was a Jew. He was the seed of Abraham. He was the seed of David. And he was going to be the Satan crusher. And through him, all nations of the earth would be blessed as he starts a new humanity, the church of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 6b, through the gospel. So the gospel's predicted in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. The gospel's hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New Testament. And Paul says that in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 26. He says, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. It's what the Jerusalem council was about in Acts 15. Do you remember when they gathered together and they had this big discussion and argument? And finally they say, you can become a Christian without first becoming a Jew. <laughs> That was huge. That was massive. That was world shaking. In fact, the early church, the first century of the church, they called themselves a third race. They weren't part of the Gentile race. They weren't part of the Jewish race. They were a brand new race, a new people, a new humanity. Verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. 
What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that I am a minister. Now, I think a better translation would be servant. I'm a servant of God by his grace and by his power. Here's what he's saying. I was a blasphemer. I was a profane person. I was a persecutor of the church. But then, by the grace and the power of Jesus Christ, I became an apostle who received this mystery. And that is my third observation. Prisoners of Christ are unstoppable. Once Paul submitted himself to Jesus Christ, became his servant, became his prisoner, Paul became unstoppable. I want you to think about Paul for a minute. What an unbelievable guy. What a unique guy. What an amazing guy. What an unstoppable man. Let's say you come to Paul and you want to stop him. So you say, Paul... If you continue to preach the gospel, we're going to put you in prison. He says, well, great. Then I'm going to write the prison epistles. I'll go ahead and write Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. Okay, so what we'll do, Paul, is we are going to beat you with rods to an inch of your life. And he says, then I'll bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Okay, Paul, we're going to kill you. And he says, yes. To live is Christ, to die is gain, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. What do you do to a man like that? How do you stop a man like that? I want you to understand, prisoners of Jesus Christ become unstoppable. Demons aren't going to stop them. People aren't going to stop them. Persecution isn't going to stop them. Prison bars aren't going to stop them. Pain and suffering and circumstances cannot stop them because they have submitted their life to Jesus Christ and said, I'm going to embrace whatever comes for the glory of God. Here's my fourth observation. Prisoners of Christ have a humble perspective. Look at verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is not a false humility. Paul's just recognized who he is. There was a time when he said, I was the greatest of the greatest. I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I kept all the rules, all the regulations. I did everything perfect. And then he had to repent of all of his goodness. Because he recognized we're all lost, we're all dead, we're all undone. We're totally reliant on the grace of God. And it seems like over his lifetime, Paul more and more understood how he was totally dependent upon God. Because first of all, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, which was early on in verse 15, or chapter 15, he said, I am the least of the apostles. Well, he's talking about the original 12 apostles and himself. That's still pretty good. I mean, you know, I'm 13th, but that's out of everybody, right? Yeah. You know? But then in this chapter, Ephesians 3, he says, I am the least of the saints. Okay, now we have all the saints and he's the least. Finally, later on, he, at the very end of his life, writes 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 1, he says, I am the chief of sinners. <laughs> I mean, he keeps going down. Now, here's what I would think. When I came to Christ, when I started out, I thought, man, I'm a man of God. I'm a man of prayer. I'm a man of faith. God can really use my life. He's lucky to have me, you know. And then as the years went on, I realized how wrong I was and how desperately I needed the grace of God. How my ingenuity and my uh, abilities and my education, it couldn't do it. I totally was dependent on the grace of God. And I think that's what's happened to Paul. Look at verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. This mystery has a fellowship. It has a community. How many of you are big um, Lord of the Rings fans? Do we have some of those? Hardly anybody. There's a bunch in the first service. There's a few here. Maybe because you're such a big Lord of the Rings fan, you've always thought, I would love to be part of the fellowship of the ring. Well, you can't. But you can be part of the fellowship of the mystery. All of those who now are part of this new humanity and are part of this mystery of God. Verse 9 goes on. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. That's because it was a mystery. Who created all things through 
Jesus Christ. Notice the beginning of the ages. In other words, this is really cool. This was always God's idea. It's not like God had this plan for humanity and then Adam and Eve fell and it's like, oh, it's all ruined. I guess we're going to have to go with the church of Jesus Christ. Or it's not like he said, well, now we're going to use the Jews. We're going to do it through the Jewish people. And, 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 and the Jews reject Jesus. They reject their king. They reject the Messiah. And he says, okay, I guess plan C. We're going to have to go with the church. The church was always his plan. Before Abraham, before Adam and Eve, before the foundation of the world, God said, my plan in my mind, my manifold wisdom says, well, I'm going to create the church of Jesus Christ. That's always been God's plan. I, I, I think that's wonderful. You guys aren't nearly excited enough. I don't. <sighs> Look at verse 10. To the intent, here was the intention of the church being formed. That now the manifold wisdom of God, that means the many faceted wisdom of God. I mean, God is all wise. And God wants to display his wisdom. And how does he do it? Verse 10 says it's through the church. The manifold wisdom of God is displayed. And then it goes on to say, and it might be known by the church. The church displays the manifold wisdom of God. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold up. Wait a minute. The church displays the manifold wisdom of God. You know, you have the church universal. You have the church local. Through the local church, God wants to display the manifold wisdom of God. You say, but I know what churches are like. I know how flawed. I know how faulty. I, I've read Corinthians where the guy slept with his father's wife. Come on. Or where they're taking communion and people get drunk. This is the church. This is the manifold wisdom of God. Or the Galatians where Paul writes, and this is from the J.B. Phillips translation. Dear idiots of Galatia. I mean, this was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. What is the deal here? It's through the church. Yes, it is through the church. The church is what God is about. The kingdom of God is the church in operation. It is the pearl of great price. It is the treasure in the field. It is the church of Jesus Christ this is talking about. And notice, it goes even further at the end of verse 10. To the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What are principalities and powers? Angels and demons. <laughs> Listen to this. Paul is saying God wants to manifest his infinite wisdom. He's going to do it through the church. And he's going to show it to the world through the church. Not only that, he's going to show it to the principalities and powers. The devils and the angels. Through the church of Jesus Christ, they're going to see God's wisdom. Someday all of it is going to resound to the fact this was the wisdom of God. Peter says over in 1 Peter 1.12... That the redemption of mankind and the forming of the church through human beings, the angels long to look into that redemption. They don't understand it all. The angels sit back and they're going, this is amazing. This, 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 this is God's wisdom. Now understand, God has not revealed his complete plan for history and the reconciliation of the universe to angels so they have to observe what's happening in the church. John Stott put it this way. He said, history is the theater. The earth is the stage. The members of Christ's church are the actors. And the principalities and powers are the audience. Folks, how we live and what we do has cosmic ramifications. And I think a lot of us don't see that. You know, we'll say, well, what does it matter if I sin a little bit? Folks, angels and demons are looking at this. You say, well, what does it matter if I'm really passionately following Christ and really engaged in the church and really making a difference in this world for Christ? Folks, this has cosmic ramifications. I think we belittle how significant the church of Jesus Christ, when it's operating as it's supposed to operate, really is. Look at verse 11. According to the eternal purpose 
which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the eternal purposes haven't been fulfilled yet. But he says which he has accomplished. In other words, when Jesus said it is finished, Paul is saying yes and amen. The God who said he's going to do it is going to fulfill it. It's going to come to pass. We're going to see it. He who began a good work, he said in Philippians, he's going to complete it. And then I love, 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 love verse 12. Listen to this one. In whom, that is in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So Paul may be a prisoner, but he says in the middle of it, I've got boldness and I've got confidence. We've talked about access. That God gave us access into his presence, which means we can come boldly before the throne of grace and pray. And when we stand before God in Christ, notice what he said. He said, we have boldness and access with confidence. So here's my fifth observation. Prisoners of Christ have a bold confidence. Literally, an absolute confidence. Particularly when we go to pray. I couldn't help but think of... 1 John 5, 14 and 15. John writes, this is the confidence we have in him. Listen to the, here, here's the dependent clause. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know we have the petitions that we desire. Now, if we can get God to hear us, we know he's going to answer And how do we know if he'll hear us? If we're praying according to his will. Where do we find his will? In his word. In his word. The key is his word. The showstopper is the word. The secret ingredient is the word. It's saying, God, you said. It it reminds me of my children when they were young. They would come to me and they would ask me. I remember Luke did this so many times. He would come to me and he would ask me to do something I didn't really want to do. And then when it looked like all hope was lost, he would say, but dad, you said. Has anybody ever faced that before? And it's like suddenly everything changes. Okay, now you're, you're questioning my veracity, huh? Now you're questioning whether I'm honest and I'm truthful. You're, you're, you're testing whether I'm faithful to what I say. Okay, you're going to get it. Oh, and I'd like to give it to you. But you're going to get just what you said I said I do. I'll do it. Now, I don't think God's like that. I think when we say, God, this is what you said, he said, that's right. I'm going to prove to you I'm faithful. I'm going to prove to you that I am true to my word. So we can go to God and we can say, God, you said. And you need to do that. Remember, we're prisoners. But but folks, you're not prisoners forever. You embrace the situation and you say, I'm using this for the glory of God. And I'm going to trust God for what he has next. So, so... So this is really dear to me because I've been doing this a lot lately. Because we, we, we're building this expansion to our North Campus. And, and so we had it all planned and then inflation kicked in and the building project went up $3 million. And um, I didn't want to do it. Because it's like, I, I'm not a big fundraiser guy and we're going to need millions of more dollars. And... Uh, You know, we've saved, we've believed God, we've trusted God, we've done all these things. We were at that place and now it goes up three more million dollars. And so God, I I don't know if we really should do this right now. And then one day God spoke to me clearly, distinctly. He said, quit dawdling. It's time to rise up and build. So I, I, I struggled with it, but I said, God, you said it, so I'm gonna do it. And so we began to build. And... There have been times it's been difficult, it's been challenging. I'm thinking, where's the money going to come from? And so you know what I do? When it gets difficult, when I don't understand where it's going, I say, but God, you said rise up and build. I didn't say rise up. You said rise up and build. And you said. 
You said you'd meet our every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You said, God, you said. And you said that you would give back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And Radiant Church has given millions of dollars to missions and, and other organizations over the years. So you said you're going to give it back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And we could use it right now. Yeah. Folks, what's your situation? Whatever it is, go to God's word and say, God, you said... Which means, God, you're faithful, you're true, you're just. So this is building my faith. This is driving back principalities and powers. This is letting the darkness know my God is going to be faithful. He's going to do what he said. He's going to do what he said. Verse 13. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation, which is for your glory. Now, what's that about? Well, Paul's in prison. And if you're one of those Ephesian believers, you're saying, boy, if the great apostle Paul got stuck in prison, that's really bad. He, he's suffering. He's going through hardship. And, and this is really hard on me. Can I really keep my faith? Can I continue to trust God? It reminds me of John the Baptist. Do you remember when John the Baptist was in prison? And he sends a messenger to Jesus. And the messenger says... Now, Jesus, are you the one we've been waiting for, or do we need to look for somebody else? What's he saying? When John's suffering like this, and the Messiah has come, and he's in prison, are you really the one? And Jesus says, go back to John and let him, let him hear what has happened. That the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. The dead are raised. The gospel is being preached. And he said, blessed are those who are not offended by me. Folks, don't get offended when people are going through suffering. Godly people, righteous. Don't be offended by that. God has a bigger purpose than we could ever know. He does. And God is always faithful. And he is at work fulfilling his divine plan, purpose, and will. And we can have confidence. We can have boldness. We do not have to be victims anywhere, anytime. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, including being victorious in times of suffering. So let's pray together. Father, I pray for all of these precious people today. I know there's some that feel like they're in a prison prison of circumstances and situations. There could be somebody here today who feels like their marriage is like a prison. They feel like their job is like a prison. They feel like their health condition is a prison, that their financial condition is a prison. But Father, we thank you that we can embrace whatever season of life we're in, whatever situation we're in. And we can say, God, and Lord, I ask this for everyone here. God, what is your purpose in this? How are you going to get glory in this? How am I going to become more like Jesus through this? Because God, you're less concerned about my comfort and you're more concerned with my holiness and your eternal plan. And Father, I pray that everyone here would have a new confidence that they can approach you based on your word, knowing that you're faithful, you're just, you're true, and you'll do what you said. That every promise of God in him is yes and amen to the glory of God. Amen. Now today, if you're here and do not have a personal relationship with Christ, or maybe you're away from God, you can be right with God today. So I want to pray with you. Let's have heads bowed and eyes closed across this auditorium. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for the Holy Spirit to move in this place right now, across this auditorium. And if you say, I'm not right with God, but I want to be, I don't know Christ, but I want to, any of those things, just slip your hand up high so I know who I'm praying for. Slip it up really high. God bless you. Others, God bless you. God bless you. I want to pray for you today. Father, I pray for these people. 
all those who have their hand raised, I'm asking right now that you would reveal your love, your grace, your goodness to them, your forgiveness, your plan, your purpose to them, that they would have an encounter with God. And if you want to receive Christ today, you can pray a prayer like this with me. Say, dear God, I know I've sinned, but I believe Jesus died in my place. But God, you raised him from the dead. And Jesus, I confess your Lord. I submit my life to you. Come into my life. Please wash away my sin and give me the power to follow you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, that's the beginning of a journey of walking with God. Let's give those people a hand. Let me say... At the end of this service, there's going to be prayer teams along the front. In front of you, you can find a connection card. Fill out the part that says, I said yes to Jesus. Bring it to them. Let them pray with you. They'll do what they can to help you in your walk with God. And now let's all stand to our feet and give them a hand once again. I'm going to thank all of you for being with us here today. So, so grateful for you. So grateful for your passion for God. I'm so thankful for this congregation. You're just, you're just great folks. And we're here to help minister, serve you in any way we can. I want to remind you that uh, there's the reception out in the foyer today. Also want to remind you that we have uh, Roar coming up here Tuesday night. And uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being with us today. And I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to be dismissed. Father, I thank you for every one of these people, that we would leave here embracing your will and purpose for our life. Determine that you're going to be glorified in our lives. And Jesus Christ is going to be exalted as we become more conformed to his image. And we say all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And you're dismissed.